That way it's not like, all right. Start webinar. And then participants. I just want to make sure I see the participants. There we go. Okay. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Growing Stronger's A Conversations. Um, tonight, we are here with Dr. Aaron Huser, orthopedic, who's an orthopedic surgeon at the Paley Orthopedic and Spine Institute in West Palm Beach, Florida, where he specializes in limb lengthening and deformity correction for skeletal dysplasia and congenital limb differences. Tonight, specifically, we are happy to be having a conversation with him specifically about limb lengthening alignment for achondroplasia in addition to now um, Voxovo treatment for achondroplasia. Um, we felt like this was an important conversation to have given everything that's developing and going on for achondroplasia today. And a lot of um, families we know are kind of getting to where they're wanting to decide, should we go the orthopedic route or the pharmaceutical treatment route, or can we do both at the same time? And so we are honored to have Dr. Heiser again here with us to have a conversation on this. Um, if you want to, Dr. Heiser, if you want to, you know, give a better introduction, maybe no, that's, you're welcome to, but yeah. That was great, Chandler. That was, that was really nice. Um, I've been at the Paley Institute I'm going on three years right now. Um, I, I did a, actually did a fellowship there back in 2017 to 18, moved up to Minneapolis, Minnesota, and was working at Gillette for two years, and then came back uh, down to Florida to rejoin the guys here at the Paley Institute. So, and yeah, I was uh, one of the first people to really adopt uh, Voxogo as a treatment um, for linear growth in patients with achondroplasia, which is pretty much the the line that the company uses with the FDA. So. Yeah, um, right. And it's very, I still feel like we're in, I can't believe now we're coming up on a year almost since it's approval, that's crazy. Um, I do wanna start off kind of with get to know you questions. Can you, you know, explain to us or tell us a little bit, you know, what made you wanna specialize in skeletal dysplasia was it always kind of an interest to you or is it something you kind of just like you know stumbled on and you know enjoyed that <laughs> path i don't know how orthopedics uh, you know find their meat. I'll, I'll try to make it short so i i really like math yeah and i like geometry and those were some of my favorite subjects in high school and then i did engineering in in undergrad and when i was a resident in orthopedic surgery um, Reed Nichols, who's at AI DuPont, came and gave our program a lecture on limb deformity correction. And that was my first introduction. And that's when she introduced me to both Drawer Paley's book and um, then the, the course at Baltimore on limb deformity. And, um, you know, that was like, oh, this would be so cool. I mean, these are really cool concepts. I spent one weekend <laughs> where my wife or my girlfriend then my wife now was going out with her friends in Atlantic City and I was like reading this chapter that drawer had had uh wrote about deformity correction it was just sort of like the basics and outline I'm like oh my gosh this is like everything I like is like making something that is not straight straight you know like making mm -hmm. knock knees or bow legs and just sort of like the fundamental principles behind it um I think that the skeletal dysplasia world, I think there's some of the most interesting patients that we have. Um, the culture uh, within each of the groups is different. And I, I love taking care of all that stuff. I think there's a lot of different um, parts of the body that are affected. And that's also makes it really interesting as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, it, it's crazy because I remember when I got Drawer Paley's book and then meeting him for the first time and then, you know, working with him now is, is really fantastic too. Cool. So. I remember, uh, it wasn't until like years ago, I mean, it's been like a long time now, but I remember for so long thinking, 
uh, like when I heard the term skeletal, skeletal, I can't even say it now, skeletal dysplasia, I was like, that's dwarfism. And then I remember um, while going through my own treatment, I met a family um, who had or has uh, MHE. And then like we started talking and they were like using the term skeletal dysplasia. And I was just, I mean, I was 16. And so I had just always said achondroplasia, skeletal dysplasia. And I was like, it like clicked in my mind. I was like, no, like skeletal dysplasia is like a wide variety of Oh yeah. Of everything dwarfism, it's just like one type of sky or I mean, there's a bunch of ty different types of dwarfism, but achondroplasia, I'll say, is like one form of skeletal dysplasia. And now I'm always uh adamant to tell on um, telling people I'm like every single form of dwarfism is a skeletal dysplasia, but not every single form of skeletal dysplasia is a form of dwarfism. And yeah. I was just, I, that's always one of my like facts I tell people now because it just never clicked in my mind because I was just always like, no, like you're not sure. You don't have skeletal dysplasia. <laughs> and then, but whatever, fun fact. I think what's so interesting too is just like, as you start seeing more and more different types and you realize that there's like subclinical dysplasias too that people just don't classify, but you start seeing different mm -hmm. body types within practice or even within your community, you start to notice things. It really becomes crazy how, how it's actually, it's more pervasive than you think. Right. Uh, skull dysplasia. So, and, and I remember like you think about people you went to school with or something where you just thought, oh, they're a little, they may look a little different or something. Mm -hmm. You don't understand as a child what is actually going on. Like you, it's really hard to understand that when you're younger. Mm -hmm. so. um, can you, so we know how you got into skeletal dysplasia and we know you're at the Paley Institute. So can you tell us if you were to have a family, say who has a child with achondroplasia and they're coming to you or to the Paley Institute for the first time with the idea that they want to seek treatment in either um, limb lengthening, limb alignment, or now box sogo, kind of, you know, how would you best determine a treatment plan for them? Obviously, we know every single patient's different and, you know, treatment plans are different, but I guess just kind of, you know, what would be a general play-by-play -play of someone who is coming to you for the first time seeking information on sure. limb lengthening or Voxogo treatment? Well, you know, I mean, some of the most important things aren't those. It's the um, cervical medullary compression up at the base of the skull, lumbar stenosis that I actually talk about first, because those are sort of life-threatening things that need to right. be taken care of and are the most important. Um, if they've had surgery or um, if they haven't, I always examine them, just make sure they don't have any pathologic reflexes. Um, we look, we talk to kids like, are you able to make it to the bathroom on time? Are you squatting uh, to get to, or squatting a lot for rest? Do you, are you able to keep up with others? How far can you walk? Questions like that. And that's really sort of our screening for lumbar stenosis as well. And then asking the parents if they snore. Um, if they're really young, like how are they feeding? Do they turn blue when they feed? Mm -hmm. Do they have any asymmetry in their reflexes? Those are things where you'd be concerned about uh, compression at the base of the skull. Um, in terms of Voxogo, usually patients are like, oh, we're here. We'd really like to get started on Voxogo. And the first question I ask is like, so what do you know about the drug? Because I imagine that most of these families have been really interested in it. They've been following it. Um, as it's evolved through the FDA process. And so they sort of tell me what they know. And then I go into, you know, what we know, like there are no guarantees with anything, but we know that on average patients in, increase their annual growth velocity by 1.57 centimeters, which is just over half an inch um, mm -hmm. per year. And then I like, there's a really good article in the Lancet, which is a really nice scientific journal um, on Vesorotide. And they break, they, even there, they break it down into different age groups, like five to eight, eight to 12, and, or eight to 11 and 12 to 16. And I talked to him about the differences. Like if you would start it now, 
this is what that group was able to achieve in terms of their growth. Like the, what's really interesting is the eight to 11 group actually has a higher increased growth velocity in the study um, for the first year than the five to seven group. You know, and most people would think like, oh, well, they're older. Why are they getting that? We don't know. It may have to do with puberty or something like that. And then the older group, um, 11 or 12 and above, you know, they had a slightly lower one, like 0.75 centimeters, which is about a quarter of an inch. So that discussion with the family is, I, it's up to them on whether they, they want to, their, their child wants to undergo injections every day to maybe get a quarter of an inch extra for the next four years. I think that's a very personal decision. Um, the limb alignment is more important to me than uh, lengthening and making sure that knees are stable and that they we get the legs straight underneath the body. Um, and then for lengthening, I'll, I, have, I have a big, it's a big talk that I give with the most important point being that nobody should tell you you need this and nobody should tell you that you can't have it. It's a personal decision. Um, and then for a, a lot of parents, I really try to emphasize like, you know, it is so important when you're raising your child to not make um, their life only be like you have achondroplasia and that is how you're defined. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like, like you can do great things. It doesn't matter if you have a skeletal dysplasia or not. And if you foster those great things in anybody, whoever they are, that's what will define them and not something that ha no one has any control over. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. So for the lengthening though, it's really like starting at age 10 and then every two years you're looking at, depending on what you want. Mm -hmm. I always tell them this too. You can start lengthening, you can stop. Um, I think humoral lengthening is really functionally a great operation because it increases reach and ability to, to um, you know, turn on light switches, yeah. open door, stuff like that, which is by far some of the hardest things. Kids get closed into a bathroom and they can't get out because they can't reach the handle, which is, mm -hmm. I can't imagine how scary that is. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, doing every two years, but also thinking, when you're psychologically ready, because as you know, it's not easy all the time, right? And as you go into it, it gets a little bit harder and harder. And so uh, when a child comes back for their second time, I want to make sure that they are, you know, have they gotten back to doing everything that they want to do? Mm -hmm. um, they, their life is normalized because I think that's a good time to consider doing another operation, but if they're still having problems. There's no way they should undergo a surgery again, especially one like uh, lengthening. They're just not ready yet. I also think at the older age, they have a better ability to say like, you know what, this is something that I want. I think mm -hmm. that the patient who's usually a child needs to buy into this because it's all, it's their body and we're ultimately working on their body. Right. Um, do you want me to keep going? I'll, no, have, you're, have, you're great. So, you're, so I think one of the, you're one totally, of the you're great. things with, uh, with Voxogo and lengthening is you know you you went through lengthening and you had fixers on right yes so what if foxogo can get bones long enough where you don't even need a fixer anymore and it can all be im right now we do most of our um, humoral lengthenings are with external fixers because we can get 11 centimeters in one go you can't get that with any nail but also mm -hmm. the nails don't fit usually in the first in, in the humerus right. when you're trying to length them and so, and some kids come in who their bones can't fit a nail either um, right away. And so their first lengthening is an external fixer lengthening. But to avoid that, I think would make a lot of patients happy. I did, we took care of one kid who was in the trial, actually two kids in the trial um, who were able to have internal lengthening uh, because for their first lengthening, just because mm -hmm. their bones were long enough, which is great. And then where I've got another child right now who is undergoing lengthening and on the medication um, and is doing well, you know, no, no changes because of the medication. And I wouldn't expect it. Lengthening actually heals through intramembranous ossification, which is Voxogo works with enchondral ossification. Mm -hmm. So there are two different ways that bones grow. Um, 
your long bones when you're a child grow through a process called enchondral ossification from cartilage into bone um, versus intramembranous. This is getting so dry, by the way. I no. fall asleep well, talking I mean, that was about a question. It. Actually, that was a question that I was going to ask. Um, just like something I've always just genu genuinely wondered, um, you know, could if you're in, since you're kind of talking about it, but you kind of just explained it. Um, but one question I was going to ask, you know, for any patients who maybe are going through um, lengthening or maybe they take Voxogo before lengthening, uh, does that help with, uh, especially like in the consolidation phase? I was curious. I, uh, I'm i curious. I'm just as I curious. I was curious if you are, taking it's... Voxogo while lengthening um, because I remember uh, arm lengthening, obviously the, that consolidation takes longer than the legs because you can weight bear for your legs and weight bearing helps, you know, with the consolidation. And um, I was older when I lengthened my own, when I lengthened my arms and I know being older and female, you know, that kind of wasn't, you know, it was uh, my bones were growing slower than like my friend who was my same age, but a male, his bones were like, I felt like he could break his bone and it would be like rock solid the next day. Whereas mine's just like little clouds, um, you know, slowly coming together. But when, uh, but for like so long before Voxogo was ever approved, that was kind of a discussion my mom and I just had among ourselves was, you know, I wonder if like, because we, you know, we knew kind of the, we knew the science behind it, but we were always wondering like, would it be beneficial to take it during lengthening? Because could it help with um, like muscle strengthening, bones growing and whatever? But I, until you just, I've already forgotten scientific words that you just used, yeah. <laughs> but it, like, I never really thought about how the, where the bones like grow for, versus, you know, how they grow from lengthening versus how they grow from because of the um box hogo so it, very you know, interesting we fact. don't know the answer um yeah. so the receptor um i i have no idea this is a receptor mm -hmm. that usually works with the physis um you do have a little bit of enchondral ossification at the ends of the bones for mm -hmm. lengthening um, where you create the osteotomy and the, you know, the break in the bone, but I, I don't know. And we'll see. I mean, my pay, the longest patient I have on Voxogo right now, that's only been under my care, not in mm -hmm. the trial is coming up on seven months. Okay. So it's just not enough time. And then if you take the ones that have been lengthened to our on Voxogo, it's just less. Mm -hmm. So we'll look at that and we'll find out. Um, I think, you know, it's just, about linear growth. And that's yeah. why patients want Voxogo. And I think it's great. Um, if it helps with lengthening, that'll be great too. Uh, but I think if it does that, if, you know, other questions that people have are like, does it help the spine? Like, can it help lumbar stenosis? We don't know that answer either. Mm -hmm. I think an answer I do know, but I don't have anything to support it is that it will probably help the arms grow longer too, which is yeah. not linear growth. But again, I think it's a functional thing to have um longer arms i just really think that is like helpful for so many things and if it makes it easier to put a nail in as well that's great too as opposed to having a frame on i tell people so. all the time and i call i call myself out on it now but i remember um and like everyone who like knows me personally calls me out on it but when i was going through um my first leg lengthening i kept on saying like oh like i'm not gonna lengthen my arms because like they're fine like yeah they're short but like they're fine like they're you know whatever like I just kind of like didn't think the drastic difference I would have with longer arms like I did with you know having the more you know proportionate and you know straightened out even limb alignment legs and everything and then um I just like I literally decided last minute when I linked into my arms, like I just kind of did it at the last minute. Um, and it kind of just worked for my schedule because I did know if I wanted to lengthen my arms, I wanted to do it before I went to college. Yeah. And so I was just like, well, I'm going to do it 
I need to do it. And so I, I literally like decided, like made a last minute decision to lengthen my arms. And I tell people, I'm like, yes, you know, when you look at, and you know, when you look at anybody with a chondroplasia and you look at the before and after photos of when they go through lengthening, people are quick to look at that. Like it's, yes, the first thing you notice is the height. Like you see the height difference and everything. But now I'm like, I point out to people, I'm like, but also like my arms and, or whoever's arms are like now proportionate to the torso. They're standing up straighter. They're, um, I sit at a desk, you know, with better posture now because I'm not hunched over and everything. And just, um, even, you know, dealing with hygiene, you know, I know it's both for feminine and, you know, male hygiene, you know, it's, I just like, arm lengthening really is like the greatest like I loved the leg lengthening and I loved everything it gave me but really truly arm lengthening is just like yeah I eat I, my like I eat my words when I was like uh when I was 17 saying oh I'm not like I don't need to lengthen my arms like they're whatever like they, they function fine and but yeah I always tell people I'm like arm lengthening you can't beat it you really it's <laughs> it is it's crazy to say it like that I mean I do think so the hygiene what's interesting is I've never really thought about it as much being a you know male yeah. I don't think about the female side of that and when we when we have patients that have undergone spinal fusion I think that length is even more helpful as well mm -hmm. too you know I think I don't, I don't operate on the spine, but there's a lot, seems to be a lot of controversy in like when and how do you do the spine and in, in patients with achondroplasia and spinal stenosis mm -hmm. and how far do you go? Um, my partner, David Feldman, uh, I work with him closely and he does a lot of spinal fusions um, and he's seen a lot and his practice has really changed into one that is, you know, do a good decompression and then do yeah. a long fusion because what we've seen is we've seen people fall off the top of their fusions uh, where they get pain or they develop a non-union of the fusion at the lower end. And so he's been really innovative with um, doing something called an inner body fusion at the lower end of the construct. And mm -hmm. then also going above into the, into the upper thoracic spine because if you stop a fusion where the spine starts to curve over, it will eventually fall over the top. And that can be painful for patients because their position, I'll go from the side, will be hunched over. And so all day they're working to pull themselves yeah. up and they'll start complaining of back pain. And I think it's also the, and please tell me if, if I'm wrong, but I think the sentiment is that people are like, you don't want to start anyone operating on your spine because it never ends. Mm -hmm. Like people end up going back for multiple surgeries. And uh, David Feldman's approach is really like, I want this to be one surgery and then you never yeah. have to have another one on your back again. Yeah. So it's really interesting. I've tried to reach out to people to like open up this discussion because I think as oh, that would be great. Pro professionals, we need to come to some sort of consensus um, that would be, that's, so that we are fabulous. not like giving out different information. And the hard part is with, for patients, if I was a patient and you're like, look, I don't have to fuse you high. I can do it through two levels and you'll be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would, I would definitely take that anytime over if someone telling me you need a longer fusion because yeah. all I'm thinking about is fusion. I'm not going to have any motion. Right. Um, and we probably, as surgeons in general, need to get better at communicating with our, our peers and our patients so that we have some sort of a unified message across the board for everybody. Mm -hmm. Because confusion in the medical world for the patient is, is miserable. I mean, I'm a doctor and we just had our second baby. And when I'm confused about ob guide, I'm like, I can't, there's no way I can even do any of this stuff, you know? So I think when we get into complex deformity reconstruction, spinal surgery, as a as a patient, it's difficult to like take all that in and have a good understanding of it. Yeah, I'm I'm one that uh, well, I have I was gonna give like a my own like comment on that, but I did want to ask um, in terms of like Q and A. Um, I know you said you know you don't do spine surgeries, but 
kind of like talking about that would you recommend say like if it was kind of like inevitable if someone knew that they would need a spine a spinal fusion but maybe you know they don't need it this year but maybe they know it's on possibly the radar in a year or two uh would you recommend or do you feel like it would be better to if they wanted to do arm lengthening doing it before or after like you know would that be would that would doing think, arm lengthening before or after make any sort of difference you think yeah i actually do think arm lengthening before would be yeah I, a good I, idea I, I because assumed, but i guess people uh, struggle afterwards the problem is if we're seeing you and you have a spine problem that trumps it trumps the arms it trumps the legs it trumps alignment we don't want to sacrifice anything yeah. for height or length. So the most important thing is your ability to use your legs, right? Mm -hmm. It's not how long they are, it's that you can use them. Yeah. And it's the ability to go to the bathroom and to not lose your bladder or bowels prematurely. That's, it's embarrassing. And it is, you know, would be miserable as an adult and older child having that problem. Um, but yeah, if, if, if you have, I, I don't know, it's hard to predict too. You know, you can't yeah. say like, you're going to need spinal fusion in two years. It's usually not. Mm -hmm. That's usually someone comes in right. with a problem. They're weak in their legs. Maybe their legs are paralyzed or they don't have any feeling in their legs. And then it's like, well, we've got to do something now. Yeah. But, but yeah, ideally you'd have your arms lengthened before then because you wouldn't have the problems because you do in the lumbar spine, you lose motion. Mm -hmm. In the thoracic spine, you lose motion, but it, it's not much compared to the lump, the lower. So I'm sorry, the thoracic spine is like the chest, uh, the upper back area. And then your low back is your lumbar spine. And you have a ton of motion through your lumbar spine and less so through, through your thoracic spine. So it all depends on how low the fusion goes in the lumbar spine. But it's more, it, you, you will become stiffer if they have to go to the pelvis. And that's really the tough one. Yeah. Uh, do we have questions? Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, you're. I love that. I really actually appreciate all that you're uh, sharing. You know, with us, this is great. Um, so, okay, you kind of answered that one. The one that we did get submitted. Um, someone said they did not. I don't know if age matters. They did not give an age, but. In terms of answering, I don't know, maybe if we wanted to like answer it from the point of like someone who's five versus like eight or 10. Um, but my son is in his 16th week of Voxogo treatment and he wants to do leg lengthening next summer. He did this, he did this past summer bilateral lengthening of the arms. This treatment of Voxogo plus the lengthening will give him more expectations of a little more inches of a little more inches or will it not make any difference or is this not a good combination to do both at the same time and again the combination no, like, age that she gave so i'm not sure if that matters at all it, you know it, it doesn't matter as much for the surgical lengthening it definitely matters for the growth that is obtained through with voxogo i think they can work together i don't think you need to stop um one or you can only do one or the other. Um, I don't know how insurance feels about that. Um, I know I had one child on Voxogo who the we actually were going to do lengthening of his arms. And because he had a lengthening schedule, they didn't want to give him Voxogo. Mm -hmm. And I wrote them back. I'm like, well, arm lengthening doesn't help linear growth. And Voxogo is for linear growth. And so they ended up, it was all fine. But okay. you know, I think there is some red tape with some of the insurance companies and by far have been the, the hardest thing for me to deal with is on some of my renewals for prescriptions that they're giving me a hard time about like, oh, and what is their growth? And with all the patients I've talked to, they're, they're gaining height, which is really awesome. I mean, it's really mm -hmm. something they're happy, um, especially when the child's old enough to see that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's fine. You know, the hard part is, let's say that child is 14 years old. And if they would do Voxogo, they would get about 1.5 centimeters over the next two years on Voxogo. So injecting yourself every day to get a half a, you know, half of an inch yeah. on average, right? That That's just what the data says. Maybe they'll get more, maybe they'll get less. And lengthening, you get 
10 centimeters if you do five in the femurs, five in the tibias, or maybe you do four and four, um, but usually you get 10 centimeters and that happens within 12 weeks plus another 12 weeks to let it heal and consolidate. So mm -hmm. six months. And so that's where I think, you know, you look at sort of the efficiency or the cost benefit of that. And that's, a, that again, it's, I believe it's my job to give the patients the information right. and allow them to make a judgment-free decision because it's their body. And some people say, you know what, I'm going to forego the box. So I'm just going to do lengthening. And someone will be like, I'm going to do both because I want to get as tall as I can, because yeah. there's a, you know, there's a difference between four feet and four feet, one inch. And yeah. that's, that's important. And people talk about it. I mean, average stature patients talk about the difference between a half an inch. Mm -hmm. So it's important. And that again, is it's a value or it's a judgment free value, whatever they, whatever they want. Right. And um, I like that, you know, you said it's your job to, you know, make sure they have the information and the resources to make their decision. Cause I feel, and I'm sure there's other patient advocates, you know, kind of in the same situation who feel the same way. I get asked a lot by parents, well, would you recommend lengthening or doing the treatments? And I just say, well, here, you know, I, here's what you know about, or here's what I know about Voxogo and, you know, this and that. And I can only, you know, give you my personal experience, everyone in terms of lengthening, I can only share with you my experience, you know, my personal experience, but, you know, a general overview, you know, you get, um, I remember, I think, you know, you get, I think an inch every two weeks. I always, it was easier for me to say inches versus centimeters, but I believe I was lengthening, getting an inch of height about every two weeks. And so I was just like, within a matter of three to four months, I was six inches taller yeah. um, versus, you know, getting an additional inch maybe once a year. Um, and so I'm just, you know, that's what I tell them. Like, you know, you kind of just need to decide what you think is, you know, better for you. Like is taking six months of time to do this procedure, do this, you know, physical therapy, all of that, you know, can you do that? Or is it better to just do the injection? You know, it's all, we all kind of have to make the decisions. Um, everyone's going to make the best decision for their families. And it's just, I'm glad that you said, you know, it's just your job to make sure they have the resources and information yep. um, for them. And so we have, I do want to say, we do have a few questions that have been submitted. So the first one is, if my child is given Voxogo between from ages through age five to 10, do you think that she will still need to get limb lengthening? So I think this is a perfect question, actually. So let's just, so five years, and let's say you get 1.5 centimeters extra per year. Um, and let's say your child is on average going to be four feet. So that 1.5 centimeters times five is about 7.5 centimeters, which is three inches. And so that means that they may be four, three. That's okay. Actually, the need for limb lengthening is really your desire if you want it. You don't need limb lengthening. Could you, could you get limb lengthening? Absolutely. And that's really, you know, if, if your child came and be like, I would like this and the the parents agree with them, then yeah, I'm happy to help them out and, um, you know, reach their goals. Um, but you, you can do Voxogo and you don't need to do limb lengthening after Voxogo. It's whatever you, whatever you're hoping to get or how you feel after you've gotten it. Um, ideally, like you said, Chandler, it's the whole idea is to get it done before the patient or the child goes off to college, because I think it's sort of like, I have an opportunity to start over. I have an opportunity to redefine my life or whatever yeah. you want. Continue my same life. Doesn't matter. Um, like I but, remember, like I like was living life obviously all the way before college, but I feel like getting it all done before college is just ideal because it's like after college, like life hits you, man. And it's just like, well, it's hard to like take a break and yeah, so surgery. Yeah. And you can do it during college, but that's your summer. I yeah. mean, it's essentially your summer where you should be having fun doing crazy stuff with crazy friends and mm -hmm. making good memories. 
Um, but yeah, so I think that's really the, the answer is that the assumption would be from five to seven, you'll get about seven and a half centimeters based on the average data, maybe a little bit more um, if you look at each age. And mm -hmm. so if you would still want to get limb lengthening after that, it's totally fine. Um, and then the next one, do you think it could be possible to have the treatment with Foxogo and then after that, when the plates are already closed, have limb lengthening? Is age a factor to consider in limb lengthening or is it possible to have that surgery at any age? It's really possible to have the surgery at any time, just like we spoke about. You can do Voxogo and then you can say, okay, I'm done growing now. What would I like to do from here? Um, and usually you still have some time before you leave high school to do that, but you can do it at any time. It is a little bit easier the younger you are when you're in between that first and second generation. So between the ages of 10 and 20, you just, the body makes better bone, um, but it may be a little bit slower, but we can still help you get to where you want to go even after you're done growing. Lengthening does not require your growth plates to be open, but Voxogo does. That's a good Thank you. I know. I know. That's what we, um, you know, like those, um, you know, in like elementary school, those like reading is fun, kind of like very like crazy font, like posters. You should put that on a poster, like in your office or something. That's, I, I like that. Uh, yeah. And um, I remember, I think it was in one of um, our first episodes of A Conversation. So just since we're kind of talking about this with um, Dr. Robbie, somebody had asked, kind of a very similar question and I think what he had said was if you if a family knows they're highly considering both um and I'm not you know going to fully quote him so people you know refer back to our episode with Dr. Ravi but I believe what he said was something along the lines of you know you're going to do both start with Foxogo and just see you know if you get the goal results whatever you wanted from it and then you know limb lengthening is there um Again, limb lengthening. Okay, I mean, I'm not an or I I'm not a surgeon, so I really can't say. I feel like limb lengthening can be done at any time, but from my own personal experience, uh, I did have it. I had my first one at age 16, which is you know pretty late in the game to start. Um, age you life. get to make that decision. I mean, the yeah. nice thing about that is you're you're the one really making that decision, right? Even though right. you can't sign a consent, but it's you're a big right. part of it. And I'm glad I totally, you know, did it when I did, because I also feel like um, the older kids, they definitely have more of that like fire in them and they know, like, they know kind of the end results, like they know the results they're working for, where I do feel like kids do understand like, oh, like this is helping my life, even, you know, with children um with you know fibular hemimelia or whatever and they're younger and you know they know whatever they're going through is helping their leg but I definitely in the older kids and teens I feel you know they have more of that drive and they're like all right like I'm doing this because this is going to better my life blah, yeah blah, blah, blah and it really I do feel like it just kind of motivates you more also I was one who was you know had a very competitive streak and it helped me to be competitive going through treatment because it kind of made it like I know there's a finish line like you also have to push yourself right it's not yeah. easy I mean no one should ever sell lengthening surgeries like oh it's it's a walk in the park you're never there'll be no problems life will be great you'll always be comfortable it's not easy especially as you get towards the end yeah. And then when you finally hit that end, you know, you're like, oh my gosh, no more turns or no more magnet, no more whatever. And each week, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but each week your body starts to feel like, oh, it's feeling like looser now. I don't feel so tight and just mm -hmm. like so stretched out. So, right. Yeah. And, you know, again, not, you know, this is growing stronger. So, not to like make it, you know, give too much of my personal uh, or make this too much personal about me. But like, I remember, uh, just a throwback because ironically today is uh 12 years that, that I made the decision actually um but I remember when I was told like you're done lengthening like you can't lengthen anymore that was like the moment 
obviously you're looking forward to since you know your day one of turns like you can't wait until you're you stop your turns because then it's consolidation and then it's just like countdown to fixators coming off yeah I remember when like I was told to stop my turns I was so like upset I was upset like because I think I was just like it was the routine of you're turning every day and you're doing this this and this and then you're told to stop turning and I remember my mom my doctor my physical therapist were all like you can't grow any more <laughs> like you can't, like we can't grow you anymore like this is it this is it and I was just like I know but like yeah I don't know it was it was a weird feeling but then um it is. I mean, so I, what I tell families when I'm like, I just had this conversation earlier this week, but let's say we measure your bone. We first do that lengthening and it measures, I don't know, um, something like, let's say 180 millimeters, which is 18 centimeters. Okay. And now we lengthen that. Or let's do, let's do 200. 200, by the way, can fit a nail. Just so you know, 200 okay. can fit a nail. But let's say we say it's 200, which means it's 20 centimeters. And we lengthen five centimeters. We just lengthened your body. So, and you're 16 years old. Mm -hmm. So what you did in 16 years or what you did in four years of your life, we just did in 12 weeks. And yeah. when people think about like your growing bone that it took me four years to grow that length, you're going to do it in 12 weeks. Like mm -hmm. that puts it in perspective, like, hey, stopping is probably a good idea because we we just, your body just did a lot of work. And, it's, yeah, you know, I looked at a bunch of patients that had lengthening done and you, you know, what's really crazy. They all lose about 10 pounds with lengthening uh -huh. because of the metabolic demand on the body. Like this is not just hard on your muscles, hard yeah. on your bones, your nerves, your arteries. It is demanding calories of you and people on average, lose weight during the whole process, which is sort of insane that your BM, your, uh, I always joke, like BMI is uh, based on weight and height. So when you lengthen, you really affect the BMI because you're getting height, but you're also losing weight at the same time. Mm -hmm. So your BMI is going down and it's, I, I don't know, it's just crazy. I mean, I really think the metabolic demand is something we, we understand, but we don't like really have great science to say like, this is how many more calories you should actually increase your diet by to maintain the weight that you are when you start lengthening. You yeah. know, when you think about healing that you need that stuff to help heal too. Right. And then I remember, um, I always, you know, I tell people I'm like, uh, cause I did do, I did two leg lengthening. So I went back for, um, a second one after my first year of college. And that one was such, I mean, we both know lengthening is no walk in the park. It's not easy. But having that, ex having the experience, I'm like, had I known in my, during my first lengthening, like what I knew with the second lengthening, it would have like made the first one go so easier. Cause I, like when I got to, when it got to my range of motion, getting tight during my second lengthening, I was like, okay, like what, I, like, I, like, I didn't care what my measurements were in physical therapy. Cause I was just like, oh, okay, they'll be fine in like two weeks. But I remember for my first lengthening, I was like sobbing that like I had lost this range of motion and like oh, yeah. the eight-year-old boy next to me had like fabulous range of motion. And <laughs> here I am at 16 and I can't even <laughs> bend my knee. But then with my second lengthening, I mean, it was literally, it was a breeze. I was like, all right, like, yeah, I'm good. I'm like, I'm tight this week, whatever. It, it, you know, it's just, it's really, I always tell people, I'm like, I'd be shocked or you'd be shocked to know, like, if you go back for a second lengthening, just how easy, or it's, it's not easy, but it's definitely easier than the first one, just because you know what to expect. Even though I had met with, you know, other patients who had gone through it still, like when you're going through it yourself, it's like, you know, you, you're still, you still have trouble wrapping your head around things. And so, yeah. But yeah. Um, I, Gosh, I mean, I feel like we talked about so much. Um, and I definitely don't want to keep you a full hour. Um, but just for those that we do have on live, if there are any more um, questions, I think we did answer that one, um, that you have, please submit them now for Dr. Huser. But 
uh if not thank you so much for joining us of course we would love to have you back maybe have an episode with you and dr feldman together yeah, he's, he's actually good. taking his like first month-long vacation in a long time right now so oh that's good i hope he's enjoying himself yes. um yeah okay. so you know the only other thing i was going to say is Voxogo is not going to be the end all for these medications that come out. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you're, I, I know you're, I know you're very familiar with new, newer ones coming down the pipeline, right. different receptors, oral ones. So I think this is just the start and um, we'll see how it goes. I think really people just need to be able to talk about things. I mean, mm -hmm. right now, not to make this a broad statement about our country, but you can't always talk about things that are on your mind with other people without someone becoming upset or angry. And hopefully, you know, things in terms of achondroplasia, lengthening growth, medications, right. hopefully we can avoid that or grow um, within the community to have these discussions openly without, you know, Right. It's, it, it'd be nice if we could anybody. definitely have more open conversations about these uh, topics. Yeah. And um, uh, I guess I'll ask it, but like I should have asked it. But I know a question that um, I get a lot and that I'm sure uh, maybe you get it. I don't know, is a lot of people do ask like, oh, so like uh, will, you know, Voxogo or any of the, you know, treatments coming up like get rid of limb lengthening and I always tell people I'm like I know limb lengthening is never going away or limb alignment like that'll never go I don't know I I mean we're gonna look at uh <laughs> we're gonna look at the limb alignment actually of the the kids in the trial probably and yeah. see it like is there improvement in it you know it's uh, but I guess I meant like you know it's not like even if like those who didn't uh like take it were like you know, like just overall, like, you know, the treatment wouldn't go, or orthopedic treatment wouldn't go. We'll, we'll always be here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Orthopedic surgeons will always be here. If there was an opportunity for someone to reach their goal uh, with a skeletal dysplasia without surgery, I would be all for it. And I love surgery. Uh, David and I always tell people we love surgery. Love it. That's why we do what we do. But yeah. if we can't help you, we're not going to offer you surgery. Yeah. And if there's a medication that can do this where someone doesn't need an operation, that would be great. I'd be all for it. I would support that 100%. Yeah. Um, and who knows, who knows about the future? You know, all you got to do is have that dream and someone just follows through on it. And you have no idea what can happen. I mean, you look at your life, right? You just got to keep thinking big. Take it day by day. Yep. <laughs> Well, okay. I think that's it. No one else um, submitted any questions. So again, thank you so much for yep. joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been joining a pleasure. Joining us on a Friday night. Thank yep. you. Okay. Um, we will definitely keep in touch and we okay. will post this um, on our YouTube channel. And for anyone, you know, watching who would like to get in touch with Dr. User, everything, we'll put all of his uh, you know, Instagram, every, well, my email, my email address is fine. Email. You can use my yeah. Institute email and stuff. Happy awesome. to answer questions. Thanks a lot. Have a good weekend. Thank I'll you. see you later. Thank you. Bye. Bye.